live on ThinkTech and its history lens. I'm John David Ann, professor of history, and I have with me once again Dr. Brian Gibson, who's an assistant professor of Hawaii Pacific at Hawaii Pacific University. And Brian is a specialist on uh, the U.S. Middle East relations and specific land. We're going to talk today about U.S. and Iran. And uh, Brian, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me back, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you on. So, Brian, we were talking last week about, uh, we went back in time talking about the history of the U.S.-Iranian relationship and some of these, what you called uh, uh, mortal wounds that, the, uh, mm -hmm. that were inflicted on both sides. I thought that was a great uh, kind of hook, a great concept to uh, kind of uh, get, get an, uh, you know, an understanding of these important moments. So, uh, Let's let's recap a little bit on the the contemporary situation. Then we'll go back and and talk about the the Iran Iraq War and and uh, developments within Iran, developments within the United States, and pull it forward. No problem. Um, essentially, where we kind of last left off, uh, things have actually calmed down quite a bit in the Middle East. It seems uh, we haven't heard a lot from Iran since the downing of um, of the Ukrainian plane which is what was absolutely catastrophic, especially uh, for you know the Iranians, but for the Ukrainians, but also a lot of Canadians, which I happen to be Canadian, uh, they died in the, in the flight as well, I think 63. So um, a real tragedy all around for everyone. And the Iranians have been pretty quiet since then. Okay. But in the lead up to that, it was, uh, it was very intense. It was yeah. A, yeah. a very scary moment in the Middle East. So, but these things are always pumping in the background though, right? I mean, the Iranians are not yeah. sitting still and neither is the Trump administration. So do you see any openings for, you know, a potential warming of relations or is it just going to stay, you know, in the, in the freezer here? I think um, that there, there's always potential for openings. The question is, do the Iranians want to give Trump something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. That I believe that the number one foreign policy goal in Tehran right now is regime change in Washington. Oh. They want to see Trump gone so <laughs> okay. that they can get someone that they can actually negotiate with who's a reasonable, rational actor. Oh, okay. um, so the Obama administration was, of course, uh, very hostile towards Iran through the first half of uh, his uh, two terms. Uh, but then we saw an opening in uh, the second term that led to the Iran nuclear deal and a, a massive de-escalation of the region at uh, a time when ISIS was also posing a major threat to both the United States and Iranian interests. Mm. So there was kind of a uh, the two the two sides had mutual interests that that aligned came together. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. an alignment of interests. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which allowed the situation to de-escalate quite rapidly. Okay. I mean, it's a lot easier when your secretary of state can call up the foreign, uh, foreign secretary in Iran and say, hey, you just picked up a bunch of our sailors who drifted into your waters. Can you release them? And Not then they're right. released the next right. day. And that's an actual, that actual hostage that crisis. That actually happened. That happened. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's but interesting. You're not that, going to get that with this current yeah, administration. It's interesting that how you describe Iran as wanting a rational player. We usually describe Iran as an irrational player, you know, the, the axis of evil kind of situation. So the Iranians are thinking about this in ways that apparently are more rational than, you know, the American administration at this point, which seems to simply want to score uh, political points, you know, the killing of. Uh, of this uh, Iranian general and and the, you know kind of trying to raise up anger against Iran so that Trump can get reelected. That's an interesting juxtaposition. Well, the thing about Iran is that I personally would never describe it as an irrational actor. It's uh, it all of its actions from the revolution through to the present are quite rational and quite strategic in their approach. They're. Um, they're quite clever in their approach to things mm. because a lot of them were trained by the Americans and the Israelis uh, during the period that we discussed last week, uh, so okay. under the Shah's regime. And they're a, a very intelligent, very cultured um, society. Okay. And they, but they're also fierce. Uh, yeah, they okay. do not want to okay. be interfered with by right. foreign powers right. like the United States or Russia uh, or Britain. 
Okay. Uh, they want to have their own independence and they want to be treated like that. So in a, in a way, they're very anti-imperialist. Uh, okay, so that this is a, as a result of this 20th century mucking about that the Western powers uh, did in Iran. So let's go back and yeah. let, let's talk a bit about the, uh, the, the recent history of U.S.-Iranian relations and, uh, and then we can move it forward. Perfect, because this will actually give us an opportunity to lay out uh, how rational they actually are. Okay, good. So where we left off, we were talking about the shooting down of Iran Air uh, 655, which killed 290 people, uh, and a U.S. military vessel um, shot it down, the USS Vincennes. And uh, this was a, a massive tragedy. It was very uh, it was horrific. Uh, people were slaughtered uh, needlessly. Now, what's problematic about this is that, well, not problematic, the Iranians then went to the UN Security Council and sought a resolution condemning the Americans for doing this. But when they arrived in New York to meet with, uh, to meet with the UN to demand a Security Council resolution, and uh, curiously enough, the candidate in 2009 who was uh, Mir Hussein Mousavi, he was the representative who went to the uh, oh. the UN. So he was part of the whole Green Revolution movement in 2009. Oh, okay. Anyways, so when he got to uh, New York, everyone said, we don't care. This war, if it had ended in 1982, none of these people would have been dead. Oh, okay. And so the UN had no interest in, in working with, um, with the Iranians on this. And not long afterwards, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini decided that, you know, uh, the war needed to come to an end. And at this stage, Iraq launched a series of devastating offensives against it and reversed the tide of the war, and it did in August 1988. Okay, now, so, so Iran yeah. took the control of the war at that point. I'm sorry, Iraq took control of the Iraq war. Iraq did, yes. Oh. Uh, with a, a American backing, okay. uh, the, the United States basically gave them a strategy on how to win, and the Iraqis Oh, what was the strategy? I, I don't know a thing about um, that. So. It, no one really does. It, it was an oh, okay. operation called uh, Surf Fisher, and what it involved was strategic targeting of uh, logistical supply points coming from the center of Iran out to the front, and they hit them in reverse, so from the far back, and then gradually moved their way towards the front lines, which meant that after a couple of days, a couple of weeks, the troops at the front had no water, had no food, and okay. no ammunition, okay. and no supplies. Okay. And that's when the Iraqis launched these devastating offensives, which involved chemical interesting, weapons. Interesting, interesting, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so the U.S. told them how to do it. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, but in the aftermath of the war, uh, Iraq, of course, uh, maintains its million-man uh, army and becomes much more belligerent in the region, which leads to its invasion of Kuwait, uh, which is a whole massive topic unto itself. Right, 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 uh, right. Worth noting, and, though, right, that, uh, yes. that coming out of this, you have a strengthened Iraq, an Iraq yep. strengthened by the Iraq. United States. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, oh, we've heard of this before, right? And then, yes. of course, they wage a war, and we have to send troops in it to put down uh, the war that they've been, yeah. But curiously, throughout the aftermath of the, the revolution in Iran, you get um, some major changes take place where Ayatollah Khomeini, who had been leading uh, the country for uh, since the revolution, he dies and oh. there's a, a change in power which leads to the coming uh, uh, the, the new supreme leader is Ayatollah Ruha, not Ruha, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei oh, yeah, Khamenei, and yeah. Khamenei is the current supreme leader and he's a hardliner right, right, right. Um, so with him coming to power is a, a big shift but then the new president of Iran is uh, uh, Akbar ha uh, ha oh, sorry, Rafsanjani, sorry. Uh, Akbar ha Hashmi oh, yes. Rafsanjani. Right. Rafsanjani is kind of a, uh, he died not that long ago, but he's uh, a revolutionary through and through, but he's also a pragmatist. Right. So right. during the Iran-Contra crisis that we talked uh, about last week, yeah. um, he was one of the so-called moderates that the Reagan administration was looking to work with. Ah, okay, okay. And, and with Rafsanjani in power, his goal was reconstruction. He's like, the country's been destroyed. We don't want to deal with the rest of the region. We don't want to keep picking fights with the United States. Yeah, okay. Let's rebuild our country. Let's rebuild our economy. And let's strengthen the revolution by being pragmatic about it. Okay. And this is and, what? What are the dates uh, on Rafsanjani? So 1989 through to um, 
I think he was in 1996. Okay. I, I maybe no. I think in 97 he left office, and another uh, uh, pragmatist came in. Okay. Now, uh, or moderate came in. Now, Rafsanjani sought to improve relations with the U.S. Uh, and yeah, he did quite a good job. Uh, one of the things when George H.W. Bush became president is in a State of the Union address, he said that um, you know goodwill begets goodwill. In other words, if the, the Iranians help out and uh and show that they can be reasonable actors in the region then the united states will respond favorably now rafsanjani then gets on a plane and flies to lebanon and he secure personally secures the release of uh, a bunch of american hostages that had been held since the mid-1980s so from his perspective or from an iranian perspective they've followed through with their side of the, the bargain right uh, but the United States never did anything. And Brent Scowcroft later on, who was uh, George H.W. Bush's uh, uh, national security advisor, uh, lamented that this was uh, one of the biggest mistakes of, the, of the, their administration, was that they should have responded more favorably to the Iranians because it could have changed the shape of the relationship moving forward. Uh, now, under the Clinton administration, the, the, ten, the tone changed quite considerably. Uh, the Iranians were included in a policy known as dual containment, which is an application of that Cold War policy of containment to uh, both Iran and Iraq. Now, the, to, in my personal view, this was a huge mistake because Iran and Iraq hate each other, and the easiest way to contain both of them is to pit the two of them against each other. It doesn't cost very much from an American perspective either. But this leads to a massive buildup of American military hardware in the region, and the United States is essentially inserting itself as the regional policeman. Now, from an Iranian perspective, this is uh, another insult, as Iran had demobilized since the war. Its, uh, war, its war economy had all been uh, shifted to domestic production. Uh, it wasn't engaged in a lot of nefarious activities, uh, which, unlike in the 1980s, where they were engaged in a lot, and in a lot of ways, the steam of the revolution was starting to slow down and or the steam engine of the revolution was starting to slow down and mm -hmm. so the iranians were quite surprised that they were uh they needed to be contained because they weren't doing anything that they felt deserved containment. Oh yeah of course makes sense yeah so rafsanjani <clears throat> then of course is undermined by like his efforts to try and improve relations with the west are then undermined by conservative elements in the country who don't want to improve relations with the west and they're like see you can't work work with the united states uh but then in 1997 there's an election because iran is uh, a pseudo democracy it has elections and the results are often not right, what right. you expect it to be with the sole <clears throat> exception of 2009 which was rigged uh but that was Okay. Uh, that instance stands outside of the norm than uh, all the rest of their elections. And this uh, election in 1997 is quite important because it leads to the coming to power of a moderate uh, named uh, Mohammad Khatami. Uh, uh, right, Khatami. Now, Khat Khatami is an interesting character because uh, Rouhani, the current president, very much models his approach towards the United States on his. So oh, okay. Khatami won by a landslide, 67% of the vote. And he was not the favorite candidate by oh, yeah, the Supreme okay. Leader by a long shot. So he comes to power uh, and has a huge mandate to reform Iran and to improve it, relations with the West. And okay. one of the first things he does, and this is going to sound familiar, is he flies to, uh, Washington, to New York for the General Assembly meeting. He does uh, a very uh, highly publicized interview with Christine Emanpour on CNN, and he says, "Hey, I, I want to work with you guys. I, I'm 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 not your enemy. Okay. I I want to improve relations with the U.S. and the Clinton administration, which was caught completely off guard by this, uh, because they did not expect someone to from Iran to be so open about improving relations. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they respond quite favorably. Now, okay. uh, I should point out that just before." Uh, Khomeini comes to power, not Khomeini, uh, Khatami comes to power, uh, there was a bombing attack in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and some members of the Clinton administration have tried to link this to Iran. 
Um, others have linked it to Al Qaeda. Um, uh, this is at the Kobar Tower complex in Saudi Arabia, and it yeah. killed a lot of Americans. And it was a, a huge tragedy. Um, the Clinton administration said that they had intelligence. Uh, they wrote to Khatami, and they said that they had intelligence that Iran uh, was engaged in more nefarious activities that he may or may not be in control of. And they wanted to give him a warning and to be like, hey, but if you work with us, we can work with you. Like, let's talk. Oh, okay. Okay. Listen, Brian, let's take a break and yeah. we'll come back okay. uh, and we'll talk more about this. Yeah. So let's go to no a worries. break. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at four o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. All right, we're back and we're live and we're with Brian Gibson, Dr. Brian Gibson. I'm no longer choking, so that's a good thing. And Brian, so we were talking about uh, Katami and and the late 90s kind of uh, an attempt at rapprochement. And, uh, and so uh, it, it's interesting though know, that the Clinton administration, which, which maybe would have been more dovish, took the same approach as maybe every administration since, you know, since uh, Operation Ajax in 1953 and, and treats Iran as the, kind of the evil empire. You know? So it's even, even the well, Democrats are doing this. There, there's an element of that, but at the same time, when Khatami came to power, they saw an opportunity and they took it. And so they sent this letter, that, which I just mentioned, Yeah. Uh, but the, men, the letter left open an opportunity for, um, for a response, for, for, for them to come back. But hardliners in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, hijacked the letter and sent okay. back a really nasty response, and that kind of fizzled things out. Oh, okay. Um, so it didn't really go where, uh, anywhere, but there was an effort that was made. Now, what's curious is that one of the single greatest periods of U.S.-Iranian cooperation since uh, the 1979 revolution, uh, with the strong exception of, of course, under the Obama administration, right, right. was under George H.W. Bush. Oh, okay. So when 9-11 happened, uh, the Iranian response was quite shocking. Ah, so you're talking uh, about George W. Bush. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant, George yeah, W. Bush. Yeah, George W. Uh, so when 9-11 happened, Iranians flocked to the streets and they held um, candlelight vigils where people were sobbing and this was uh, right, all caught okay. on film okay. and uh, this was a genuine outpouring of grief. Hmm. Now, uh, it, I should point out that there's a lot of Iranians who have family members who live in the United States. Right. Uh, the Iranian people are actually pretty clued into American culture. Uh, curiously, a lot of, uh, actually most of the current president's cabinet have PhDs from American or British universities. Oh, okay. So these guys are all fluent in English, including the foreign uh, minister. So um, it, there is a strong connection between the Iranian people and the American pe people, but we, we don't tend to talk about that. Now, uh, with this outpouring of grief, what you get is, is quite fascinating, is that uh, as the United States uh, begins its, uh, you know, the start of the war on terror, the first target is Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is an enemy of Iran. Uh, in 1998, uh, the Taliban stormed the Iranian embassy and uh, killed a bunch of diplomats, Iranian diplomats. And Iran nearly went to war with Afghanistan at this point, specifically with the Taliban. Um, so this is uh, quite important. 
because when the United States is saying we're going to go in and we're going to take out the Taliban, the Iranians are like, yeah, thank you. We would appreciate okay. that. <clears throat> so they're ready so to join when, in with the Americans then at that point. And they do. So when CIA special and special forces arrive in northern Afghanistan to link up with the Northern Alliance, which was a group of Uzbeks who were opposed to the Taliban, uh, who do they find there but the Quds Force, oh, which, of course, is led by uh, Qasem Soleimani, right. who the United <clears throat> States just killed. Right, right. And the Quds Force and the uh, Iranian intelligence officers help the CIA and special forces and the Northern Alliance go in and seize Kabul. So they worked with the United States to overthrow the Taliban. Hmm. And then in the aftermath of that, the American Very and Iranian diplomats wrote yeah. the Afghani constitution together. Oh. So this isn't, right. this is diplomats sitting down at the Bonn <laughs> conference in 2002, writing the constitution that was then implemented in Afghanistan. And this is like so, a hidden history because I think very few Americans know this or have easily, conveniently forgotten about this alliance during. Very the, few know, people understand War. this, other than people who are uh, were high level Bush administration, State Department officials, yeah, and right. uh, CIA, and um, you know, uh, and people on the National Security Council staff. Which uh, the source for this for me is members of the National Security Council staff. Okay, and. This uh, cooperation even survives the axis of evil speech, which is quite significant. Oh. Now, what's curious about that is that in the early drafts... In, hang on a second. So you're that, referring to George W. Bush's uh, speech after 9-11, which identifies Iran as one of the three kind of evil countries along with Syria and North Korea. Uh, with Iraq and North Korea. Oh, pardon uh, me, Syria Iraq wasn't. and North Korea, right. And what's really interesting about that is that when the CIA and the State Department vetted the speech before it was given, they said, you need to take Iran out of this oh. <laughs> because they're working with them. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're cooperating with them on a level that had never occurred before. And they are getting results because their interests are aligned. But the Bush administration it didn't, didn't happen, them yeah. and put it back and well, put it in. Right. Well, this is the issue because, with Iran, U.S. Iran, Iranian relations. I mean, it's this stalking horse, right, of, of the Americans absolutely. choosing political convenience over over what looks like it should be an important uh, partner in the in the in the Middle East. My gosh. Well, you know, oh, anyway, well, and keep going. And that's right. what's curious is that the, the, mil, the intelligence and diplomatic services are all completely in favor of working with Iran. They see the benefit of this because there's an alignment of interest. Right. But right. guys like Dick Cheney in the White House have no interest in, in Iran right. and are very hardline doctrinaire individuals. And they essentially veto uh, uh, the, this proposal to keep Iran out of the axis of evil. Yeah. And so Bush goes ahead and gives a speech, but the diplomats still keep working. And then, of course, Iraq is next on the chopping block right now from an iranian perspective again if the united states wants to take out iraq go right ahead they fought right. an eight-year war against this guy who used chemical weapons against them they yeah. hate Saddam. yeah they want yeah. him gone right and we but, thought iran was our enemy and now we're taking out our enemy's enemy <laughs> it's it's quite very, curiously very confused and weird situation yeah <laughs> But there's two different pers uh, yeah. perspectives in Iran okay. on this. The one yeah. is that the United States is just taking out their enemies and they're happy with this. So moderates oh. don't have a problem with this. Okay. And so the Qatari <clears throat> government doesn't have a problem with this. But then there's hardliners who are like, the United States is surrounding us. Yeah, okay. Because you have Afghanistan to right. its southwest, right. uh, sorry, southeast, and then you have Iraq to its west. So right. the United States has two major militaries uh, or armies on both yeah. sides of Iran. Right, right. Now, neither of those conflicts went particularly well. Right. And part of the reason for that is because the Iranians don't right. want the Americans setting up shop inside Iraq. Um, right. Now, they may have been happy for Saddam to get taken out, and they were happy for the implementation of a democratic system. Yeah. Uh, because, of course, uh, democracy is the tyranny of the majority. Right. And the majority of Iraqis are Shia, and so are the Iranians. Right. So in that sense, you have 
Iran, uh, sorry, the United States handing Iran Iraq on a golden platter. Right. So shooting, is, hang on. So shooting forward to the present day, you think it's yeah. fair to say that that the Iraq War and the American involvement in Iraq has actually emboldened Iran and strengthened Iran uh, in the kind of the Iran, Iraq, Syria region? Immeasurably. Yes. This is okay. the reason why right now we have essentially a sectarian cold war going on in, in the Middle East. Yeah. The removal of Saddam, who is a Sunni, over a Shia majority state, right, right. flipped the uh, sectarian balance of power in the region against the Sunnis. Yeah. So the key Sunni player in the region, of course, is Saudi Arabia. Right. Now, Saudi Arabia... Uh, uh, ascribed to a much more doctrinaire, uh, orthodox kind of hardline interpretation. Right. Of them. right. The, the uh, whereas the Sunnis in Iraq uh, are much, much more uh, like a milder version of it. Right. Right. Yeah. But uh, in getting rid of Saddam and pushing the Sunnis in Iraq into the background and uh, emboldening the Shia, um, you get a really complicated situation yeah. where. Um, the, what's uh, there's a thing known as the Shia Crescent, which runs through Iran, through southern Iraq, and then up into Iran, uh, Syria, and then down to Lebanon. Okay. And this Shia, it's called the Ark or the Shia Crescent. Okay. Um, it kind of becomes united because Saddam stood in the way of that. Okay. So now Iran has a, essentially an overland route to uh, its Hezbollah allies in. Uh, in Lebanon, but also right. its Alawite allies in in Syria. Right. So, Brian, now, we have we have a little less than a minute left. So, uh, okay. what's interesting to me is the United States today has entered into this sectarian war on the side of Saudi Arabia, seemingly in to me the oh, most they foolish. Have absolutely. I mean, yes. what a foolish foreign policy mistake to to take sides in that. I mean, that goes this way is, beyond is, uh, right the Middle a 14... East. Hundred year old conflict right, between right. Uh, the yeah. two sects of Islam, and taking a side is not a good choice. Right, right. And the Obama administration was a lot more uh, inclined to just kind of step back and right. and not take a side. But right. the Trump administration has thrown in everything yeah. with yeah. the Saudis, and this has put them in an. Uh, a terrible position with right. the Iranians. So, Brian, we're going to have to end it there. But thanks a lot for coming on, and uh, we'll have you on again. So take care. Not a problem. Take care. Have a good one. All right.